I see you've made your way past enemy lines to the Dark Outpost. Welcome, patriots. I'm David Zublik, your host on this excursion to the darkest outposts of the human mind and beyond. Thank you for being with us once again. We appreciate it. We have a great show coming up for you today. In just a few minutes, we will be joined by Jesse Zaboder of Illuminate the Darkness, at IlluminateTheDarkness.com. She joins us each and every Thursday, with some rare exceptions, but she will be here today. She will be answering some of your emailed-in questions, and if you have some questions for Jesse, you can still email them to us while we are on the air. Please send them to this email address, davidzublik at gmail.com, davidzublik at gmail.com, D-A-V-I-D-Z-U-B-L-I-C-K at gmail.com, and we will answer your questions on the air. We have some questions that came in during the course of the past week. We're also going to be discussing Somerset Bellinoff and Glamis Castle. I have some questions for Jesse about this woman and about the history of this haunted castle. We'll get into that with Jesse as well. And then a little bit later on in the broadcast, Peter Kirby and Jenny Silcox will both be joining us to talk about chemtrails as we continue our deep dive into Peter's book, Chemtrails Exposed, The New Manhattan Project. That'll be coming up a little bit later on today. And then, in the final hour of the program, your telephone calls, open line conversation, and the news of the day. All right? So before we do any of that, uh, let's do as we do each day and take a moment here to honor our nation and its flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, thank you very much. Real a quick uh, thing I want to bring up here. This is important. You heard about the Colonial Pipeline. They just paid a ransom of over $5 million after 5,500 miles of its systems were shut down by hackers. Now, this is a, a major reason behind why you might be seeing some rising gas prices. Pain at the pump, $5 plus a gallon in some parts of the country. The FBI reported that the group responsible for the attack goes by the name of Darkseid and are based in Eastern Europe. Well, if these mega corporations can be held hostage by hackers, how hard do you think it would be for them to target you? Nobody, and I repeat, nobody should be online without using a VPN, a virtual private network, because nearly anything or anybody connected to the Internet is vulnerable to hackers, and that means you and me, and that's why I highly recommend Virtual Shield. Virtual Shield is a fan favorite of Dark Outpost. It is my favorite VPN on the planet. I've tried a lot of them, believe me, and Virtual Shield is the best. With Virtual Shield, you can hide your identity and help keep your information secure while you browse the World Wide Web. It works by routing your data through encrypted virtual tunnels. Doing this increases your safety against potential hackers and helps keep data like your banking info and family photos hidden from prying eyes. It's easy to use. It works across Mac and Windows platforms on every phone, computer, and tablet. This is the only VPN that we here at Dark Outpost will ever use. You can take advantage of a free 30-day trial uh, with a uh, with a 
an extended 30-day money-back guarantee as well if you go to virtualshield.com forward slash Zublik, virtualshield.com forward slash Zublik, or just click the link in the description of this video. Get Virtual Shield today. You will not regret it. All right, let's bring in our guests as we do each and every Thursday. Hey, Jesse Zaboder, how are you? Great. I, I am too. It's, it's a beautiful summer day where we are. I hope you're having nice weather where you are. Yes. You sound like you're feeling well. Yeah. yeah. Very sunny outside. So. I love it, love it, and we we will keep it as at an undisclosed location, <laughs> but we'll do, but as long as you're doing well, um, I want to be begin first of all, with, obviously with an update. Um, tell us what's going on in uh, Jesse's world and illuminate the darkness. Yeah, this this week um, I was at a special conference for uh, supporting women vets with uh, Jean. Uh, who's helping me work on some of those veteran projects that we're doing. So it was really great. We got to meet uh, many of the uh, colonels and different uh, military people who support veterans here. Um, and also, you know, we had one, I got into a conversation that was very interesting. Okay. Uh, but it, he's a former um, sergeant major uh, who works now with law enforcement, and we're going to be bringing him on right on radio. Uh, but as we were talking about the veteran suicide rate, he brought out that the same um, number of law enforcement are being lost. So we're losing like 22 people in law enforcement a day in the U.S. So, to suicide. So that was huge. So we're going to be focusing and bringing out... Um, some more of these issues because I think there is some interconnecting pieces. So, you, you know, uh, and, and I'm glad you brought that up because a lot of people don't, don't think when they think of our veterans or they think of our, our, our first responders, um, they don't really realize that a lot of what people in the first, I, I'll bet you, you would find that uh, people, EMT uh, technicians, you know, emergency medical technicians and firefighters as well who are in the they're, they're under a tremendous amount of pressure a tremendous amount of stress and especially now with our police officers you know and, and this anti-police movement that seems to be per, uh, pervasive across parts of the country where they're calling for defunding the police or they're being uh, you know uh, called every name in the book and that sort of thing um the pressure is great on them and, and you can get PTSD from that job just as you can from being a, a person in, in, in the military, correct? Yeah, absolutely. Any form of trauma, you know, repeat it. Usually it's repetitive complex trauma that causes the PTSD. Um, you know, I've been bringing out some of the physical issues that I think the, you know, adrenal glands and some of the hormones because of the constant stress and repeated, um, trauma that that causes, you know, some of the PTSD issues. Um, so, I mean, it really is something that has to be addressed, you know, physically, emotionally, and spiritually at the same time, dealing with uh, the PTSD. So you, you, uh, your organization is going to work on, on helping those people out as well? Yeah, we're going to start bringing forward some of those issues along with, you um, you know the issues we're bringing forward for the military and the veterans. So, okay, I, th I yeah. think that's I think that's awesome. Um, how about an update on the uh, on the Netherlands? What's happening there? Yeah, um, I, I think that's kind of as far as I know, it's still the same. I haven't gotten any further updates since last time we talked on that. Okay, oh well, that's fine. I just I'm always trying to stay you know, informed of the latest situations there. Um, some, I, I've been, you know, I follow you on, uh, on in, uh, Twitter. Uh, I'm trying to think of them on every platform possible, but uh, Twitter's the one you seem to be most heavily. I just got one. No, it's only, that's because with the, the high monitoring, the, they only let me on the one channel. <laughs> really? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Well, they cut all my other access. Ah, <laughs> uh, uh, that's that's terrible. I, I this cancel culture is just. And anyway, obviously you have a you know um, 
in addition to myself, you have a huge following of people that really love you and appreciate everything that you're doing for, for all of us here. Um, uh, and I was following a thread. I, I don't know if you saw it because it didn't necessarily, it wasn't directed toward you in particular, but it was a, a woman, I believe her name was Madison. It had a weird spelling for Madison. Yes. And she was claiming, and the reason I brought in bringing this up is because we, there was an article in the uh, news this week indicated that uh, Rick Warren, the pastor of Saddleback Church in California, is stepping down as the pastor of that church. I, I never really knew too much about the guy. I mean, I, I, I read the, the, the Purpose Driven Life at one point. I thought it was a decent book. Um, but um, there have been accusations coming out uh, that he might have been involved in some sinister activities. Um, and this woman, Madison, seemed to indicate uh, she was following you on another, uh, maybe might have been right on radio. I think it was the Reveal Report. She was complimenting you on a, on a, on a thing you did on the Reveal Report. But she was also uh, doing a thread in which she said that she had been trafficked by Rick Warren. Do you know anything about the Rick Warren situation? Do we have anything to be concerned about with him? Yeah, yeah, I would encourage people to yeah. touch base and connect with Madison. We just brought out... Um, I did a show with her and Carmen yesterday morning, and then we did one that will be coming out today on Right on Radio. And she talks more about the tribunals that she, uh, there was, I, I believe she said over 100 that she testified at. Um, and it did include individuals like the one that you named. Okay. And she is aware of, um, like on our show, she'll bring out some of that stuff. And then... Um, it sounds like, you know, the things you were saying are very, very true of this person, that there is material things. And um, mm. yeah. I think you and I brought him up once before. It has been so long that I, but then when I heard that, it kind of re kind of refreshed a, a, a something in the back of my mind. I said, well, so, yeah, and I would I would actually, I reached out to her and sent her a direct message on Twitter. And uh, but I would like to get her on the program as well. <laughs> Uh, if she can come on, so I will. Do, and I've also tried to reach out through the contact that you gave me, your program coordinator, your uh, uh, the individual that, that books your your guest appearances about Kathy O'Brien. I never heard anything back from her. I'd love to get her on the program. So I'm gonna I'm gonna reach out to them again and see if we can't get something. Yeah, I'll on. definitely. I can reach out to Madison and see if she'd like to come on and stuff. Yeah, I, she might not know who I am, but she knows. But the reason I reached out to her is because she knows you, and so I thought if you let her know that I'm, I'm, you know, and I can understand people are afraid to be put on. They don't know who somebody is. And they don't know if they're going to be. I'm not going to challenge her, just like we don't challenge no, no, you. She she really wants to get the info out. So I had mentioned to her um, some of the different platforms I'm on. So I'm pretty sure she'd be encouraged to get on and talk because yeah. she really really wants to bring her story forward. And get the info out there. So very good. All right. Well, we'll take we'll take care of that. I'll reach out to her again, and if you can mention it, be great. Yeah. Um, now, I want to. Here's what I want to. Before we get to questions, we have we have a few uh, today. But before we do that, I wanted to ask you about. Um, I wanted to talk about Somerset Belknoff. I know we, we've talked about her. It's been a long, long time ago, and I uh, I know who this woman is. I know the 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 incredible things, uh, terrible things that she's been involved with, but. Um, I don't, I, we haven't talked about her in a while, and I was wondering if you could give us like a primer on who she is, who, what Glamis Castle is, this purported uh, haunted castle, they say, um, and how she is involved. She is, according to what I've read, the, the, the supreme Illuminati person, uh, and I, I want to get a, a little bit of information about her from you if that's possible. Yeah. Um, so from my understanding, and, uh, you know, Bryce is the person who has all the historical information on right. on Somerset, but, um, you know, she basically is connected to the royals, the Queen Elizabeth as a cousin. Right. Um, so from my understanding, you know, she is bloodline family. Um, you know, how I w interacted with her was through the Satanic Council. I would challenge, you know, she's not the supreme individual on that okay. council. Okay. Um, but does she have a lot of pull? Yes. Uh, part of that pull is because of, you know, their bloodline family uh, connection. They're considered, you know, the green dragon family. So they're one of the top 
you know, uh, 13 families okay. and he would be the head person for, um, you know, the third, one of the 13 bloodlines, um, you know, but her standing then would be pretty much equal to the other 12. But, you know, I would agree that she has a bit more pull because of things she does if people are not in agreement with her. You know, she's a very strong-willed woman. So that's all I can say about that. Um, but, you know, um, she's, you know, we're, we're both similar in several ways. We both like to argue with, with God and with Satan. So, you know, yeah, I'd say that's probably her she, thing. But um, my connections were very limited with her, uh, primarily to just the incident in... Um, you know, in the 1980s, when um, we had Prince Philip had brought before the council and was angry about the dandelion weeds that I was picking weeds out of the lawn. I remember you and, telling me that. Yeah. So that was probably, you know, that was one of the very few incidences I've ever interacted with her at all. So um, um, have you ever been to uh, to Scotland? Um, I believe that I was there not directly like through, you know, it would have been through traveling through the spiritual gates uh, when I was at Nurse von Stein. And um, some of the incidences, you know, um, that I have recollection of were in that 1982 year. And I know that I was at the Black Forest Lodge that I saw a hunt there. Um, there's another. Uh, tell us about the hunt. Now, th these are, are hunting parties where they hunt children down. Am I correct? Yes. And uh, so we've talked other about survivors that. have claimed that they observed that same year a hunt at uh, Glamis. But um, I, w I wasn't there in the fall. Sure. As far as I know, it was the spring. So okay. um, with that hunt, you know, it was the one that they do like every five years they instead of just the elites uh being released to hunt the children who are on the grounds they will allow the protectors who are the wolves and the vampires to hunt and so it's kind of like a free kill so that's the hunt that i saw there at the black forest lodge and uh you know they did have like they kept the hierarchy children will stay indoors, but that's where then they're uh, like some of the older men, older women. So like Jacob Rothschild, others would remain in the house and would hunt and perpetrate sexually on the the kids that were left in the house. So that's where I, in my in, um, thread, silence breaks forth into song. Um, you know, I talk about one of those hunts and um, that, you know, me and my training partner and we had a little one year old who was one of the Rothschild uh, uh, grandchildren. Um, we had him with us and we hid in the boudoir that was in one of the bedrooms because we heard Jacob coming with his other grandson. And then they happened to come into the room that we were hiding in the boudoir in, and we witnessed Jacob Rothschild um, performing sex magic with mm. his one grandson. Oh my God! So, yeah. so, so the, the the kids that stay inside and the uh, uh, the Illuminati that stay inside are like they're too old to go out on a on a hunt in the forest. So they right, just they, these are these are for you. We'll leave them in the house, and you can just chase them around the house or something. Like that. I'm not trying to make light of it. I'm just saying. Uh, yeah, you know. and most of them are younger children too. So I think you know that oldest grandson, he was 12, but you know there weren't that many 12 year olds that were there. Most of the kids mm. I would say who were in the house are were, you know, like five and under. So a lot of the you know, one and two year olds are the ones being, you know, they let them run and they, they pretend they're playing hide and seek, but they're really, once they catch you, you know, that's when they perpetrate on these, their own hierarchy children. Yeah. Is uh, Somerset a 
recluse because there's only one photograph of her on the internet that I'm able to find. It's a photograph of when she was, it looks like she's in her early 20s or late teens. Um, you can't find any other pictures of her. Uh, she's in a, she was, a, a, I'm assuming, how old would she be now? Do you know? I, I believe she's in her 80s now. In her 80s, okay. Yeah. Um, so that's, it's just, it's, it's, but you, but obviously she's not a public, per, like some of these other people, the Rothschilds, they're out in front of the public. You see pictures yeah. of them all the time with, with their fellow, um, perpetrators, but, but she doesn't seem to come out very much. No, you have the, you know, they have their face front people, but the people who wield the real power and authority, um, you know, are kept behind the scenes. So even the mothers, yeah. you know, the true ones, you never see their faces. They look and live just like regular people, you know, and I believe that for the most part, she lives like a regular person as well. Um, but, you know, then they have the face front people. So, you know, individuals like Gloria Vanderbilt and Lori Cabot Kent, they're more out there and that's who people associate with the system. Right. That's, a, a, that's, that's interesting. Well, you certainly have had uh, quite an experience. And uh, as a result of that, of course, you still have your, I'm still following the war going, <laughs> which, which I, what I love about you is you stay above the fray. You, you are not getting down and dirty with these people. You have so many people that are willing to, like myself, who are willing to just run to your defense and say, this is a woman that's been through hell and back, literally. Um, but you still got this, uh, I'm not going to mention his name, but I, I, I mentioned him the other day because I was, I, it was like a talking points uh, commentary that I did at the beginning of the show in which I just said, you know, this, these people who are going after Jesse, uh, it's, it's not, this is ridiculous. Why would someone make something like this up? Why, you know, it, 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 it's over and over and over again. I feel so honored that they, you know, that they spend so much time meticulously dissecting my life. And, you know, I don't appreciate the the lies or the, you know, the deception, the twists that they put in there that obviously are not true. But um, it's just so, you know, I, I sit there and I think, my goodness, like, how much time do they really, really spend? I mean, it's been the same group of people for over five years. And, y you know, it's like, usually, we'd go through periods where they would, you know, for like a week, it would be, you know, nonstop harassment. And literally what the one time I had over 432, you know, notification tweets from them in a day. And that went on for like four days when my son was in the hospital. And, you know, this tells, I'm just going to bring this out. This is their Christianity. You know, I put out a message that I'm going into emergency surgery with my son and, you know, he's in a very bad position and we need prayer. And just because I included, you know, all my friends, you know, like Lucian Greaves, I'll put that out there. You know, I, I've worked with him with the gray faction and, you know, I'll just say we're just, you know, associated. So it's not even like a deep friendship, but he's somebody that I consider a a really nice person. Right. Like and you said you could you would de you would debate him and still disagree on things and yeah. still Yeah, I mean he'll debate but he he respects you know, he has never disrespected my beliefs and you know, he's just always been somebody that if you know, I bring out stuff with Gray Faction or the ISSTD therapists or other things, or, you know, people don't know this, but he actually pushes for a lot of chaplain rights as well, because chaplain rights have really been attacked in the past five years. So that's a ground that we both, you know, can commonly stand on. And so because of that, I, there's a mutual respect, I feel, you know, I guess I can't speak for him, but I feel he respects me. So, you know, I included all of my Twitter friends and just said, hey, you know, pray please. And these individuals who claim to be Christian spent the next four days, and like I said, over 432 tweets in one day, harassing me just because I had included him in the tweet request. And it's like, are you kidding me? Like. 
they not, not once did they say, is your son okay? Uh, how can we pray for you? Yeah. What do you need right now? Instead, yeah, you think, you think they are just in yeah. the hospital with this nonstop attacks on you're a horrible person, you know, you, you, if you were a real Christian, blah, blah, blah. And it was like, well, you know what? I am a real Christian and I will stand before God, you know, laid bare. And I know the Lord knows exactly where my heart is. Yeah. And, I and so, and so do, so do most, so do most of us. We, I mean, the, those of us who support you, we know that what you went through is, and there are so many people coming forward uh, because of you saying, oh my God, I, I and, and who kept, who would have probably kept their mouth shut and never said anything and never healed or, or, or um, attempted to heal because unless you had come forward and said, this happened to me first. So, um, and, and these people, the the agenda that they, they seem to, well, I, I wonder if, and of course, you, you may know this, you may not. It, obviously, you're saying they're so-called Christians. I'm, I'm concerned, are you concerned that maybe they're involved in, the Illuminati and their plants. They're not really Christians at all. They're, they're just trying to discredit you that they're maybe they're involved in some of the stuff themselves. I, I will say we know who these individuals are and there definitely is, we'll just say unkosher things in their lives that yeah. has been brought to attention. And, um, you know, that's, that's all I can say. No, I understand. The whole thing. Yeah, we do. We are aware of the whole thing. And, uh, you know, I, I mean, would when I take a look at come forward and, you know, that they would that they would really I guess, you know, what I'd like to see is if people, you know, my heart is just that every survivor gets to have their voice out there. And what we have happening is you have individuals who are coming alongside of survivors pretending to be advocates, pretending to be supporters of those people, pretending to be good Christian people. And, you know, survivors already have trust issues, but these individuals are really, really good at making you feel that you can trust them. And so you, you know, share things, they know the right questions, you know, to ask that would make, that make these survivors share more and more. And then they start with the little, you know, um, almost like discrediting questions or, you know, like they're debating. And, and so then it puts the survivors like, oh, well, I have to prove to them. Then once you've given them the proofs, they take all those things and they find a way to use them against these survivors. Then they get in their little jihad and start attacking. Mm -hmm. And so I've watched as, you know, originally it was like there was this very large group of survivors online and all of us were trying to just speak out and share and collaborate our stories. And instead of that being the powerful thing that it could be, this group has come in and dispersed the survivors and made it so that, you know, instead of continuing to fight through that constant nonstop drama, most survivors just are, you know, hold their hands up and saying, that's it, I'm done. I'm not going to say anything more. I'm not going to be part of this community. I'm not going to talk. Okay. And they just back out. And so really what it has done is it silenced people. And, you know, several of us have just gotten where it's like, okay, we're not going to get involved in the drama. And we know what God's called us to do. And we're just going to keep marching forward no matter what these people do because you know the truth needs to be out there and you know if we're not going to be silenced anymore you know we were silenced the majority of our entire lives and you know we're just not going to do it anymore and you know the other thing is we don't need to prove every single aspect of our lives you know there isn't a single one of us that are doing it for alternative motives, you know? And so it's like, you know, I've just been standing with people, you know, I know the, I know the survivors, I know by their stories, if they're true or not, are there people who pose as fake survivors? Absolutely. But 
you know, the ones that I stick with, it's like, I will go to any means to help you get your story out there and to tell your truth. You know, Madison, um, Cheryl Beck, Cisco Wheeler, all those individuals, you know, mm -hmm. it's like we're just going to all stand together and fight through, you know. And, and we're, we here in the media that support you, the, the, those yeah. of us here at uh, Dark yeah. Outpost, uh, right on radio, obviously, uh, the Reveal Report and others, we're, 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 we're going to be behind you forever. So you have, you don't have, you're never going to lose our support either. And we uh, need that. I mean, we, you know, it's like, uh, there are so many of us survivors that, you know, would have given anything as kids to have one person believe us, you know, so now to have so many people who come alongside of us and support us and encourage us, um, you know, for us, that's priceless. You know, we couldn't yeah. ask for more. So thank you to everybody. And yeah, I do appreciate, you know, I know who's, who are my fans and who are not. So yeah. I, and I appreciate it. We always will be. You can count on that. Um, now, you mentioned the, uh, the chaplain's rights. So let's get into that a little bit. I, what, uh, what kind of things, uh, difficulties um, do chaplains face that it's gotten to the point where uh, you need to organize and, and, and uh, what kind of things are they doing to you to, to make your job more difficult? Well, primarily in the government, uh, it started with the government, the VA hospitals, where, um, you know, they, they do it under the promotion of patient rights. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that every chaplain would agree, you know, we don't go in there to push our Christian beliefs or to get people saved. Um, I guess I won't say every Christian or chaplain, but you know, the majority aren't there for that. They really want to meet patients' needs. And so at first, you know, the, the VA hospitals and the government, you know, they just wanted to make sure that chaplains were not doing that, using their positions to proselytize. Um, so, you know, as they started pushing that um, idea, you know, they basically were taking away the chaplain's rights. So they were saying, well, sure, you know, if the patient asks you, you can pray. If the patient asks, you know, you can read the Bible or bring a Bible with you for them um, or give them a Bible. If the patient asks, you know, you can pray in Jesus name. But if not, then you can't do any of those things. And it's like, we're a chaplain. Our, our job is spiritual care. How can you provide spiritual care if it's not, you know, with the Bible, <laughs> with prayer? Um, you know, it's like those are the very basics. So um, many of us were having to find ways around that. Or, you know, there were individuals who um, had to fight for their careers because, um, you know, the government would fire them if they were praying in Jesus name. Um, so, you know, it's like if you had a complaint, then they would let you go. So it got to the point where, you know, every patient you visited, you'd have to ask, you know, would it be okay if I say a prayer with you? Mm -hmm. When I pray, is it okay if I pray in Jesus name? You know, and you have to get their verbal consent before you do anything. Um, even, you know, would it be okay if I share this scripture with you? Like, you can't just speak out scripture. Um, so, you know, part of it was that. But then, you know, you have the other part. Um, you know, it was getting where it was almost impossible even to work with individuals who, who were not Christian because, you know, they weren't really allowing for the facilitating of patients' needs. Um, so, you know, one of the areas that's hit, and I'm not, I am not promoting Satanism at all, but people have to understand that what affects the one affects the other. So as they limited or targeted, you know, people who were Muslim or people who were Buddhist or people who were Satanists, then it even affected the Christians as well. And, you know, to the point where unless you're the Catholic priest, you know, you can't pray with a patient. Um, and so, you know, we've had to, you have to work with the other groups 
and it becomes a thing where um you know you're really advocating for the true rights for your position um you know i don't know how to get into all of it but um you know it kind of was double-sided because you know as they limited certain groups they were bringing in their own programs through states or through the hospital system. So I had several hospital systems that wanted to bring in these programs where, um, and I won't say the specific name of the program, sure. but basically like it, it made every patient's death exactly the same. Like you would, a patient's dying and, and you would go in and you would, you know, um, start altering the mood and the environment. So you'd be adding, you know, different types of fragrance or smells that would be relaxing, calming. You would play with the lighting. Uh, you would put on certain types of approved music, um, you know, and, and then um, this music would have chants or other things in it that are supposed to help the patient feel more relaxed. Um, you'd have and the energy healers come in and do massage therapy again to help the patient relax so this was the type of program they wanted for every individual's death and they even had approved things that you would say so you would say things like you know the god in me bows to the god in you and i'm sitting here like are you freaking kidding me oh. you know it's like it's like all right um so, you know, what I advocated is that, hey, like, you know, my job of, as a chaplain is, first of all, to meet the patient yeah. and to to ask them questions, to assess, you know, what are their physical needs? What are their emotional needs? What are their spiritual needs right now? And then my next question is, how can I help to make sure that all those needs are met Partic even especially during their death. You know, it's like, what does that person want, you know, as they're dying? What do they feel they need? Um, you know, I go back to, I had one patient once, um, his most favorite thing in the whole wide world, his children said was the song, The Yellow Rose of Texas. And, you know, he couldn't, he couldn't vocalize that that need um you know he was uh unconscious and stuff like that okay but we were at the va system and they have a locked internet so you can't, can't just go make a cd so i had to go down you know f argue with the administrators who run the internet and say hey could you just download this song on a cd for me then i had to get a cd player as I got it up there and we started playing the song, we're standing at the end of the bed, uh, me and the guy's son, and all of a sudden you see his feet like tapping. He's unconscious, but his feet are tapping. And as he left this world and went into the next, he went out dancing to that song. Wow. So now that to me, you know, is, is a time where that patient needs at end of life were met. He died happy. You know, he died with something that he loved, not something that I pushed on him. So you've got that kind of dual duality where they're telling you that you as a Christian can't go in there and push things on people. And yet the hospital systems, the government, they're trying to push things on us chaplains and put us into a mold and say, you know, we decide what's best for the patients and you form, you know, to our mold and everybody does the exact same things. And, you know, it's like, no, this is not the way it works. You know, if I've got somebody who's a Satanist as a patient and I go in doing this stuff, mm -hmm. like they're not going to be happy. Why? Because I haven't listened to a single thing that they need or want in that moment. So, you know, that's probably the greatest thing that I respect about Lucian is that he does pick up those things that are happening. And, you know, he's a huge voice for those things. And people don't even look at that. Like they don't, 
um, you know, they don't get past the Satanist part. They don't know the vocal advocate that he is, even for chaplains, even for Christians. Um, one of the other things he's pointed out, he calls it the theocratic movement. Um, and, you know, at first, it even to me, I was like, wow, he's really targeting any Christian in government, right? But as I started doing my own research and looking into it, I realized that this movement links with the Senator Project. It links with some of the patriotic things that are coming out now. And it looks good on the outside. It's got that appearance of godliness. Right. But I am telling you, the whole thing is top Masonic, mm. um, you know, agenda of the light side of the system. And I was like, holy cow, this is not good. And it's like, no, I don't want to join with this stuff. I don't want to give these individuals rights into our school systems, into our government programs. You know, it's like, I don't want them to have access or rights to that. You know, would I like prayer back in school? Absolutely. You know, but the the program that they're promoting, it's the same stuff that the Jesuit private schools put out, the same stuff that, you know, the MK Ultra program schools yep. have been teaching kids for years. So it's like, I don't want the same package given back under a different name. I mean, that's what it is. So, you know, if we get past sometimes those things that turn us off about individuals and we really look at what they're saying and doing, you know, there's more to people than, um, you know, what's just always at the face front. And so, um, yeah, that's my whole spiel on that. But I would encourage people to look into all those things because they do affect all of us. And, you know, when you're in a war, there's times that you have to join with people who might have different beliefs than you in order to win that war. Um, you know, I think there's going to be a time where Christians, we're going to find that true Christianity, that we are a majority. And, uh, you know, are we going to allow the light side of the system to rise up or are we going to fight that side of the system? Um, you know, you, you brought up some interesting points that I would like to follow up on. First of all, you, as a chaplain, obviously, um, I would assume that it, a decent portion of the people that you minister to are indeed fellow Christians like yourself. And for them, it's, it's a little bit easier for you to, to work with them. But you mentioned de dealing with people of other faiths. How do you handle dealing with a Muslim or a Buddhist uh, or even a Satanist. Have you ever had a Satanist as a patient who out and out said, yeah, I'm a Satanist. And how do you deal with that? Yeah, I have. Um, you know, so that's part of you have to be willing to build relationships and connections. Um, you know, one of the biggest groups that I had to work with were the Jehovah Witnesses. Mm. And they're, they tend to be a very exclusive group. So you know, they tend to not want to build relationships or connect. But um, in Portland, you know, we had a great uh, Jehovah Witness bishop and stuff, and he was willing to work with other faiths. And he could, you know, so he'd be the person if we had somebody who was Jehovah Witness, you know, I would refer them to him, I'd call him up and say, hey, we've got, you know, somebody here from your church. Um, you know, they'd like to meet with you. Here's what room they're in. And, you know, they requested a visit. So you get where you're coordinating and connecting with these people. The same with an imam um, or a Native American um, chief. You know, we call them up and just say, hey, we've got somebody here. They'd like the chief to come. You know, they want you to come and do the sage cleansing in the room, things like that. Um, we don't have to be present for that. We just have to get the person to the room and connect them to the patient and you know we can't meet as a chaplain we can't meet that person's spiritual need right um is it blasphemous to facilitate it or let it happen you know i i wrestled with that question 
And it was funny because the Lord has an answer for everything. So the verse that he showed me or the passage um, was when, you know, Naaman, who was this uh, big time military leader, um, he had leprosy and he came to the prophet um, Elisha and wanted healing. And mm -hmm. Elisha didn't even go out to meet him. He sent his servant out and his servant told Naaman to go dip himself seven times in the Jordan River and he'd be cleaned. But Naaman, you know, was mad because Elisha didn't even show him the respect to come out and meet him. And so he started complaining and his servant said to him, hey, you know, do you want to be healed or not? Like, how do you know? this guy's blowing you off. Like, why don't you go dip yourself in the river seven now, times? What do you get to lose? Let's see what happens, you know? So he did. And sure enough, the Lord healed him. Mm -hmm. And so after that, you know, he, he um, sent a message to Elisha and he said, can you ask the Lord, you know, I have a special request in his position. He'd have to go into um, the temple of other gods and, you know, bow down with his commanding officer, um, you know, and, and help him up and down and things like that when he kneeled. So he said, could you ask that the Lord will give me grace that when I have to bow, that the Lord will know I'm only bowing to him and not to these idols or gods. And, you know, so he's in that temple. He's having to, you know, bow before these idols with his commanding officer and Elisha sends back the message and says, the Lord, the Lord will give you that grace. And so, you know, that I really believe that speaks to that chaplain work that, you know, the Lord knows where our hearts are. He knows that we're not bowing to those gods. And, you know, I always pray and ask for, you know, the opportunity to, to witness to these individuals you know, even though I'm having to facilitate. Um, and, you know, how does that witness comes that comes through, you know, respectful conversation, getting to know, you know, their imams, getting to know their bishop, getting to know their tribal chief, you know, those connections. That's where you get the opportunity to, you know, talk with these individuals. And many of them, you know, they do want to talk, you know, they are friendly people. Um, you know, they will invite you to partake in their things. And, you know, I would just say, you know, no, thank you. But, you know, let's do coffee or lunch sometime, you know, and, and meet them <laughs> on that, that mutual ground, you know, so. Uh, how do you, in the case of a Satanist, I mean, because they, I'm sure that, a Buddhist, uh, uh, you know, even a, a Muslim, uh, you know, you, you can you can see how to how to facilitate them, even if you can't, you know, witness with them or pray, you know, with them. But if, if do you do you contact a satanic uh, church or or, or to, and say uh, we got a guy here that needs uh, wants you to? I mean, how do you handle that? Yes, um, you know, there. I was very thankful that I never got requested but oh. we have had chaplains that had to um you know go as far as to go to the witchcraft paraphernalia store to buy black candles that could be lit in the chapel you oh. know so um you know it just depends on what the patients ask the majority of them you know will have someone in their family bring their items or things yeah. they feel that they need them and then you just have to you know, give them a space to do that. Um, there's really nothing you can do to prevent it. You know, I did um, some of the groups that I worked with, you know, one was at a, a patient's death. So I was with the patient and then actually um, her daughters who, you know, were Satanists came in and it was funny, like, I didn't even notice they were there. Like, they, it was like, all of a sudden, they were just standing right behind yeah. me. And I was like, oh, hello. Um, but, you know, they walked in, and I was just singing over their mother and, you know, just um, making sure that she looked nice for when they came and stuff. And so when they came in, that act really touched their hearts. 
and they sat there for hours and talked with me they invited me to you know the the mountaintop to do um the spreading of her ashes and you know i, I was like well you know what are how do you do that ceremony? Like, what exactly are you doing? And they, mm -hmm. you know, were talking all about it, explaining it. And so I just, you know, I ask people a lot of questions and because not all of them are the same. It's not, you know, like when I was a kid, there were certain rituals or things that were done a certain way, but that was with the high Luciferianism. Right. And you can't just assume that everybody does everything exactly the same. So, you know, I talk with them and ask and, you know, if with those groups, I, you know, I, I don't offer, you know, if they ask me as a chaplain to do something that I can do to my capacity, then, you know, I am required to do that. Sure. Um, but God has been really good that, you know, I haven't had to do things like that. And usually he'll open it up the other way where, you know, like, some of them will ask me just to sit there and continue singing because they're like this, you know, there's just so much peace. And they're like, we, yeah. we haven't felt that peace. Will you just keep singing? And, um, you know, I've officiated a couple funeral services, but, you know, there was nothing that they did out of the norm for those. Um, so yeah. it gets interesting. I mean, it's a, it's a fine line because, you know, the hospitals or other, you know, at least now with my private chaplaincy, you know, I can dictate what I'll do and what I don't. But you that's, always have that's what you're doing now is a private, yeah. more of a private thing. Okay. Yeah, I have my own chaplain services. So, you know, I still have the ordination, the credentials and everything. Um, but can you, you know, officiate weddings too? I do not do that. Okay. <laughs> so, this is curious. Yeah. Yeah, um, I've been asked many times, but that was something um, it, it would get very hairy situations. Yeah. So I just across the board said, no, I don't officiate any weddings, um, but I do do funeral services and things like hmm. that. Well, and then that's... all my work is with community chaplain work right now. So. Yeah. Well, you're, you're doing the Lord's work, I'll tell you that. All right, let's 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 take some questions for you and see what's happening here. Um, this is interesting. This is from uh, Brandy. She said, uh, Hello, Mr. Zublik, Illuminate the Darkness contact referred uh, you your email for questions for Jesse. As I understand that they are overwhelmed currently with mail. In one of the broadcasts, Jesse recommended that we return to videos with you and Pastor Good Dog, and I have been listening intently to Jesse's testimony. I live in Reedsport, Oregon, which is on the Oregon coast, and Jesse mentioned Oregon being dirty for ritualistic activity, which I adamantly agree with. I believe that where the Lord Almighty places you in life, that is your territory. So I've been fervently praying and walking to anoint any of uh, my community and my state where the Lord leads. I've gone to Voodoo Donuts in both Portland and and Eugene and anointed the grounds and put oil on my shoes and visited both places and I will continue to be God's warrior for other sites. I've also followed the directions for a tunnel which is 20 miles east out of Coos Bay, Oregon and prayed and anointed that spot. I did not see any activity but it also explains that it is very well hidden. I feel called to be God's warrior to bring the captives out. Currently Oregon is deep in sleep and I'm wondering if Jesse could connect me to an underground teen child rescue team and other prayer warriors? Um, I don't have uh, any direct contacts that I can direct people to in specific areas. Um, you know, so I think I what I personally do is I ask the Lord and pray. Um, that would be my encouragement for that. Okay. Um, yeah. Oh, uh, and then, um, yeah. Go ahead. I guess that's all I'll say on that. Okay, that's fine. Um, and then she mentions that she's lived in Oregon since age 16, felt this call most of her life, but never really understood until this past year would have meant. She said, I believe that COVID-19, as Jesse said, matches the trafficking trails and is intimately connected to the trafficking of our children. It is the real life it is the real virus. I'm assuming she means trafficking. Also, Jesse talked about hoodoo witchcraft 
And in Sisters, Oregon, there is a Hoodoo Ski Resort, which I thought she might think interesting. I know you're all incredibly busy in this Great Awakening, so I do understand if you're unable to get back to me. I'm concerned for my state, my community with all the children. I want to serve the Lord in any capacity that I can, raise awareness and uh, be boots on the ground. I'm a state-certified alcohol and drug counselor and work with uh, uh, co-occurring clients, women and children, and anyone who is struggling with addiction and PTSD. Learning about adrenochrome has been the most earth-shattering for me, as I wonder, how did my profession not know of this evil, wicked addiction? So I, I, she's wondering why people didn't know in her profession don't know more about uh, adrenochrome addiction. Yeah, I guess because they usually don't ask their patients and it's not on any of the checklists that are given yeah. out. Nobody puts blood on there. Do you have an addiction to drinking and consuming blood? Um, if you put that question on there, I don't think people would be honest enough to answer it. Right. But, um, you know, unless it's on there, people are not going to bring that one out. How, uh, as an aside question for me, how does or, or will people who have received the COVID-19 vaccine, how does that affect people who are addicted to adrenochrome, uh, especially if you if you have someone who is, a, uh, you know, a, an Illuminati person, a Satanist, but they're opposed to the vaccines. <laughs> so if they drink the blood or ingest it in some way, they're going to get the vaccine, right? <laughs> That's a great question. Isn't it interesting? I mean, there's a little contradiction. I mean, you are going to get it. How do you guarantee that blood has not had the vaccine or that it has? But yeah. Yeah. Very that's interesting thought. It's, it doesn't really call for an answer. I'm just kind of, it's an, it's an yeah. esoteric, uh, you know, rhetorical. I haven't question. heard any of the vampires communities. No. Complaining, nor has there been anything about it. Um, I haven't seen anything with the red cross with the blood drives either. So that's really interesting um, when you think of like the blood um, transplants and other stuff like that. There has been nothing about that. Like well, it's, you no can't get blood unless you've had the vaccine or vice versa. Well, the, here's the thing. I, I heard, I've heard conflicting reports. I've heard some people say that you can still donate blood if you've had the vaccine. They'll take it. I've heard others say, "Well, you really can't because let's say you you have a you, you're type A and somebody else is type A, and you want to give your blood to them, and they've had the Moderna vaccine and you've had the J and J vaccine. You can't mix the two together. So, I mean, aren't you in? I mean, there's all kinds of issues. I mean, this huh. off topic for what we normally discuss, but it really." <laughs> But it's interesting. It was an interesting thought for sure. And you mentioned the word vampire. Let me ask you something. Are vampires real or are they, and if they are, are they simply what we've now come to understand are really uh, Satanists who um, ingest the blood of their victims? I mean, or are there certain creatures that are vampires? Uh, I believe they're fully human. Uh, mm -hmm. From what I experienced as a child, um, I brought out that they, both the vampires and the werewolves are connected to the protector system. So they're generational, you know, uh, family lines. Um, they do come out through Vlad the Impaler, and then they cross with the different um, Russian lines. So you know, there are some different, I'll put there's some, there's several different vampire lines, but you've got like the Moravian line and those who are going to be connected with the French bloodline and they're actually connected to the royalty. So you do have some vampires who are from those generational families, but they, they're rulers within their family uh, sections. Um, so, you know, you have a French ruler, you also have um, a ruler for the Russian system and th that breaks where you've got the vampires come through the Romanov line and the werewolves come through the Rasputin line. Um, then you also have the Italian ruler 
family for the vampires. Um, they tend to rule in different regions and they'll all associate themselves with a castle. Mm. Um, and then, you know, that castle dictates the rule in the region where those individuals are. Um, you can look up vampire community. That's probably the most extensive website. Um, and on there, you know, you can really see where the different vampire regions are, where they tend to gather. You know, if you really look, you can find this information. Um, but there's individuals like, you know, Father Sebastian, Murdoch's ex are probably the biggest two uh, vampires right now in our day. And, uh, you know, from what they put out, the majority have gone more to almost what they call like a psycho energy vampirism where they steal energy versus okay. drinking blood. live blood. Yeah, they will do sorts of blood. So many who do say that they, um, you know, will get blood from blood banks or they actually have their own blood banks too. So they do more the blood banks um, or synthetic blood, which I was like, well, what's the purpose of like plasma? Blood? You mean? Yeah, I'm like, there's nothing really in that. So it's like, yeah. what is the purpose of that? But anyway, um, yeah. And is it the adrenochrome in that blood that they want? Is that what they're drinking too? For, for, uh, drinking it for? I, I believe that that's the majority of it is the yeah. adrenochrome. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Well, I have to I have to do an entire show on that at some point. But um, yeah. and another thing, you mentioned werewolves. They too are real. Yeah, yeah. And the same thing. You've got you've got a person. Uh, from what I saw, is at age five they take their rights, um, their family rights. So at that point, they inherit the family's demonic spirit, which is a changeling spirit, and that's the spirit that allows them to shape shift um you know i have a friend who you know he was delivered by the lord um from that and you know so i've asked him questions like is it you know is it kind of like a spirit that causes a delusion that makes people see you in a different form or do you physically change form and he said, no, it's physical. And, you know, he started talking about the damage that it does to the body. He said that the majority of individuals who um, have these shape-shifting demons will have major tendon, ligament, uh, soft tissue, especially joint issues mm -hmm. uh, because of the shape-shifting spirit, um, you know, will move things. And so um, it it's interesting. But, do you, do yeah. you know anything about, um, the reason I brought up uh, werewolves now, do you know anything about Skinwalker Ranch? Um, I am familiar with the Skinwalkers, and yes, they those would be uh, considered the, the shape-shifting demons. Um, the Skinwalkers tend to be very um, connected with the Native American right. tribes and tribes, yeah. Interesting, interesting stuff. All right, another uh, uh, viewer uh, who absolutely adores you. Her name is, uh, I think she's Polish. Her name is Zoilina. She says, I'm writing to you from Poland. I just overheard that Jesse has translated her book in Polish. Can you tell me where I can get it in Polish? Um, if you want to send her my email. I will. I'll forward it right now. It. Yeah, tell her to request it in Polish, and I will send her the Polish PDF. All right, very good. I, I'm gonna. I'm just gonna put this right in here while I've got you right on the uh, on the lines, and it's just it is. Yeah. Right off. I'll, right say right off. A, I'll say a thank you to Pastor Lucas who uh, who translated that, and he, he's been, as far as I know, uh, sharing that. Um, they're in Poland, so yeah, I God, that's fantastic. I'm I'm just so happy that you're having um, success getting this this wonderful ministry and this one uh, helping so many people. Um, Annette wants to know, God continued blessings upon you and your ministry. My question is that I keep seeing the same set of numbers everywhere I go. Someone told me that they are monitoring spirits. Is there any truth to that? 
I don't know if they're monitoring. I've heard things too about, um, you know, the, that they're angels trying to communicate. Um, you know, I, I'm somebody, I just pray when I see that. I have periods of time. Um, actually, it was just like about a year ago where every time I looked at the clock, it happened to be 424, which is- Oh yeah, happened. yeah, right. And I was like, what, what's up with that? Um, so I just pray, I ask the Lord, you know, Lord, is there something you want to share with me? Is there something you need to get my attention over? Um, if there is, could you, you know, would you just make it clear? Um, if not, you know, I just rebuke any evil spirits that are trying to use this against me or communicate to me. So that's kind of what I do with those. And, and uh, what about this 1111 movement? Uh, that, that number seems to be coming up lately with a lot of people. Is there anything that we should know about the numbers 1111? You know, none of this stuff spiritually really makes an impact. And I guess what I see in some of these movements is that, you know, people get so focused on, you know, decoding and knowing the meanings and interpreting um, that they they get their eyes off of the Lord. And, you know, really the Lord needs to be our focus. And if he's going to do or use something, you know, he will always give us the interpretation or the revelation with it. So, you know, if I see a whole bunch of things like that coming up, I'll say, okay, Lord, is there something you want to reveal to me about this? If not, you know, I'm just rebuking anything yeah. evil that could be associated with it. Um, you know, I'm not somebody that believes that, you know, we need to be seeking out angels for revelations or things like that. Um, so, yeah. Okay. That's where I stand with that. Um, Tara wants to know, she says, I'm a long-term meditator. This morning, this came through from Spirit. I tried to message uh, Jesse on her website, I do not have a URL, so not forward. I saw an, a heaven. I saw in a heavenly realm, a very dignified group, ladies all in white, lovely dresses, simple but beautiful, very elegant. Their message is dance for the children. One day soon, this will happen in physical reality if it is not already. This is also a message all of heaven is watching as children get rescued. The dream team dance for the children. Any comment on that or? Well, no, I think that's a beautiful vision. Um, hopefully the, there will be Christians gathering together and dancing together with the children. You know, I've, I've prayed that, you know, as they're released, that they're, you know, the Lord will do a miraculous healing in the children's lives. And, um, you know, scripture talks about when the captives come out, that they'll come out with songs of joy and, and with rejoicing and dancing. So that's what my prayer is that, you know, there won't be this long, hard struggle for these individuals for healing, that they will come out, you know, with this miraculous healing and be able to just sing, dance, rejoice, and testify, you know, of, of how the Lord has brought them out. Um, so that's a beautiful picture, I think, of that time. You know, I, I, a thought also occurred to me, I wanted to get, because this is a fresh story in the news. It's been around in the news for a while, but now it's starting to hit the mainstream media. And that's the story of these Aboriginal children in Canada. Uh, there were mass graves discovered. Uh, so far, I believe they found the bodies of 200 children that were in these, uh, these uh, outside of these Aboriginal schools, which are run by the Roman Catholic Church. These kids were kidnapped and uh, taken to these schools and kind of like uh, um, North Americanized from their, their Aboriginal upbringing. And then apparently they were, I assume, sexually abused and tortured and murdered. Do, do you know anything about that? Have, have you, has your ministry been involved with this at all? Um, yeah, the main person bringing a lot of that out is Kevin Arnett. Yes, I've had him on the program. It's been a while. Yeah, Sarah Westall just did an interview with him, and we're trying to get him on uh, right on radio. Um, you know, I, I witnessed quite a bit, and I would just say, you know, there are mass areas like that. Um, trying to think what else to say here with that. Um, well, only what you can what say. I heard no? from 
current individuals looking into those places and locations is that it's just it's more than even we could imagine it's more than any survivor is aware of from those areas so um it's it's massive it's big and it's horrific yeah. so i'm gonna I, I'm, a, I'm gonna have to get kevin out. back on the program too i'm gonna have to get uh, he's been on two or three times and it's been a while it's been too long and now and when he was talking about it nobody else was talking about it and uh and now all of a sudden it's like oh well, the, well, when did this happen you know well it's <laughs> it's happening um so i'm gonna i'm gonna have to get him on as well uh, think, yeah before you go on um I think the thing just to prepare our hearts for is, you know, we've been told certain things about history, um, you know, especially around Aborigines or Native Americans or, you know, those who um, were select tribal individuals out of the Amazon, different areas like that. And to think that things are not what you understood them to be in history, you know, mm -hmm. I think it's going to be pretty devastating when the truth comes out on all of that. Well, and when it, I'll tell you one thing, when it comes to the Catholic Church, nothing surprises me anymore. I mean, I, I, I'm a Christian, a committed Christian uh, like you are. I was raised Catholic, but I abandoned that that denomination a long time ago because of what I've what I've what I've already seen. So, um, Nick wants to know. Says uh, uh, this message is for Jesse. Hope you're doing well. God bless you. Uh, may God. God bless me. The Lord be with you and your spirit. Your information on Reveal and other shows are mind-blowing and highly inspiring. When shining light, I fear not any threat on myself or my life, but I do fear for threats on my loved ones. You mentioned there are evil reactions to your holy acts, break-ins, disabling breaks on vehicles, etc. How does one defend against those attacks if we provoke the dark one and shine the Lord's light upon them? Yeah, well, I guess first I would challenge, I don't believe that shining the Lord's light is provoking the evil one. Um, you know, there's a time where the Lord says, expose or show the truth. And, you know, as we do that, yeah, the enemy's going to get mad. He, um, you know, but it's not a purposeful uh, provoking you know, and I think in that the biggest thing is that we have to trust. We have to always be listening to the Lord in all things. And in reality, you know, we don't have control. There's not, you know, anything that we can do to prevent those or prevent others from perpetrating evil acts or retribution back on us. But what we can do, you know, is we can put on our armor every day we can be fervent in prayer and, you know, we can rebuke the evil one. We can, you know, ask the Lord for his divine protection. And those are the things that we walk in. And, you know, as we do that, you know, I've seen the miraculous, you know, the things where I didn't have control over, like, you know, when my brakes got cut, um, you know, I didn't even know they were cut. Like the vehicle yeah. drove absolutely fine for me. So um, the Lord in his divine you know, mercy provided the protection that I needed. Um, so, you know, I guess that would be my thing is just continue steadfast and close to the Lord and, you know, continue to do the things that we can do. Um, you know, anoint, put on your armor and be fervent in prayer. And trust the Lord. I guess that's the other thing. Trust in the Lord. Yeah, the the, the Satan is going to be. Uh, he doesn't need anyone to provoke him. You, you could you could do nothing, and he will be provoked because yeah. he's evil. You know. So you you cannot fear doing the right thing for the fact that you might provoke him because it, it does it doesn't it doesn't matter. And, um, and, you know, the deeper you go with that. You know, I think about it at a, at a deeper level, you know, I guess that's the first step. If you if you just want to complete the first steps, do what I just said. If you want to go further, you know, there's a lot of intercession. There's a lot of time spent at the Lord's feet, you know, where your prayer is not just, you know, for a few minutes or an hour a day. You know, there's times where I'm interceding for, you know, six to eight hours sometimes longer yeah. and you know 
in there, like when we're up fighting in the heavenlies, you know, we're literally in the courtroom, we're bringing petitions before the Lord, you know, we're countering the enemy's petitions and, you know, entering into that courtroom battle in the heavenlies. And, you know, are there books on that? No, but will the Lord show you if you want to do that type of intercession? Yeah, he'll, he'll teach you how to do that. Um, but, I was, you know, not many want to invest the time, nor, yeah. nor the retribution um, that comes or the retaliation. There's always a price to be paid for doing the right thing. Okay. Um, here's an interesting one, and I'm going to, I forwarded this to you already, uh, but I'm going to forward it to you. I'm going to mention it on the air, and then for, it's just been forwarded to you again. You may have already been in contact with a woman by the name of Jill. Um, and she says she serves with the Tree of Life Healing Room, located in a suburb of New Orleans, and they're part of an international association of healing rooms out of Spokane, Washington. And she says she does, we do deliverance and inner healing. And she wanted to ask if you would be available to come and teach their team at Tree of Life. Um, and I forwarded the information. If you want to get back with her, you can uh, do this. I don't know if you make it a point to go to, to address these uh, types of groups, but if you are um, open to that, I just uh, sent that your way. All right, thank um, you. All right. Um, let's see. All right, let's, here's one about anointing oil. Blessings to illuminate the darkness praying warriors. I would love to receive the anointing oil that was prayed for by Jesse and her praying warrior friends. I'm moved by this path of anointing the land and desire to be a part of it. I'm not sure which is the proper way to ask for it and to cover the cost of the shipping. Yeah, uh, if you just want to forward that email, we'll make sure she gets some. All right, I'm going to do that right now because I know that I'm sure that I'm asking a question that a lot of people uh, want uh, answers. Uh, yeah, so we do have a website uh, for those out there who'd like to request. Yes, yes. Go to uh, write on anoint at gmail.com, and I believe anoint is all in capitals, and uh, you can request oil there. Okay, or right better, on anoint. Better yet, actually, my uh, colleague was reminding me, uh, you can also go to the covertheearth.us website. This is probably the easiest way. Just go to covertheearth.us, and on there, there's a place where you can put in your information to request the oil and um, your address and other things, and then we can just ship it straight to you. So that's the Perfect. easiest route. That would be that would be great. Uh, Laura wants to know. We'll make this the last question of the day. In reference to Jesse's prayer request for her lungs, uh, I would like to pass along this info. I've dealt with chronic lung problems for years and finally discovered the underlying causes, and received tremendous help at UT Tyler Lung Hospital. I see Dr. Pamela McShane. I would like to offer my home in Dallas, Texas, 1.5 hours from Tyler, as well as a ride to Tyler and back if you're seeking treatment there. I'd also love to share my spiritual protocol for the healing of my lungs. For the vetting process, you can look me up on Amazon. My book, Words Speak, His Word, Your Voice, speaks of bringing heaven to earth through a specific process of praying God's word. I used to have a website, Words Speak Online, in which I sold prayer products for the renewing of the mind. I've also been through the vetting process for the SOS Army. Uh, just, uh, I didn't... You forward what, that email to me. I'm going to do it right now. Now, let me, are you, so that, so that the prayer warriors in this audience can be of help to you. I didn't know you're having any lung problems. You want to tell us about that? Well, I'll say what I can say, but yeah, no, I, um, I do have some damage from, um, last, from this, past March when I got poisoned. So it hit the lungs. So I'm just dealing with that on a daily basis now. You got, well, well. Yeah. All right. So, well, let's. Yeah, prayers let's, are appreciated. Prayers get me through. Always, always. And I, for a speedy and full recovery, uh, I didn't, I was not aware of that. So um, why don't we close with a prayer today, Jesse, and so that we, yeah, all of our viewers. Right. Heavenly Father, I just thank you so much for the loving support and encouragement of this group and all of us that we gather here together, Lord, and I just appreciate each one, Lord. I thank you for all those who reach out and connect 
and engage, Lord. And um, I'm just so thankful to have so many individuals who are like-minded, who are in the fight together, Lord. And it's so encouraging to see. And I just pray for each one out there today, Lord. I know that all of us have our struggles. We all have our areas um, where we need prayer, we need encouragement, we need emotional, mental, and physical, and spiritual support, Lord. I just pray that whatever the needs are today, Lord, that you would meet those needs, that you would make a way where there seems to be no way. I also pray for divine healing, Lord, that for those out there who are sick, who are struggling, um, who are not having any success in it, it just feels like they're dealing with chronic issues that never get better, Lord. I just ask for your special touch today that you would bring that divine healing, that you would speak the word and say, I heal you, and that they would be healed, Lord. We just praise you and we give to you all the glory, all the thanks, because you are good. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. And please... For Jesse, all right. Please uh, pray for Jesse, and uh, and we love her very much. And Jesse, we'll see you again next week, and uh, we'll uh, take on more topics. And we love you, and God bless you, and have a great week, and feel well. All right, all thanks, right. David. Bye, bye bye now, Jesse Saboter. Illuminate the darkness at illuminatethedarkness dot com. Right on radio dot com, the Reveal Report, as well. You can catch her on all those great uh, shows. Uh, she's also on with Chantel Mayberg on Aquarius Rising Radio in South Africa. You can pick her up uh, on uh, on YouTube. Jesse Sabota, the great Jesse Sabota. We love her very much on this program, and we support her 1,000%. Okay, we're going to take a quick break in just a couple of minutes, and then we are going to be joined at the bottom of the hour by Peter Kirby, author of the book, Chemtrails Exposed, the New Manhattan Project, as we continue our deep dive into chemtrails and the agenda behind them. And today, there's going to be some scientific things, uh, some things that are going to need some explanation. So joining Peter will be Ginny Silcox. She's going to be joining us uh, also. Uh, we had her on yesterday to talk about HARP, and she's going to be back on our program next week to talk, to talk about directed energy weapons. But she's going to be joining us in a few minutes to help Peter explain some of the more scientific aspects of the chemtrail agenda. So that'll be coming up in just a couple of moments. And for those of you watching it live, you'll see it all. We also have open line conversation coming up with you in a little while here in the program. For those of you who are watching this archived on BitChute and Rumble later in the day, the program will be ending for you in just a couple of moments if you're uh, if you didn't see it live if you want to catch the full program you got to become a member of the dark outpost inner circle that's where you get the full show every day all you got to do is head on over to darkoutpost.tv sign up for a one year membership it's only $29.99 for a one year membership and that gets you access to information that you are not going to get any place else great topics great conversation and great voices talking about the things that we need to talk about. Stuff like this. Yeah, just head on over to darkoutpost.tv, sign up for a one-year membership, email me a copy of the receipt for that one-year membership, and in return, we'll send you back either the original Bundle Plus or the Bundle 2. All you got to do is tell us which of those two bundles you want. Well, what's in the Bundle Plus and the Bundle 2? Well, for those of you watching live, in just a little while after our conversation with Peter Kirby and Jimmy Silcox, We'll tell you what you get when you uh, sign up for the Dark Outpost Inner Circle membership so that you can pick between the Bundle Plus and the Bundle 2. All right, quick break, about three, four minutes. When we come back, Peter Kirby and Ginny Silcox continue our conversation on Chemtrails Exposed, the new Manhattan Project. Stand by. Peter Kirby and Ginny Silcox are next. Next. 